And we're live, everybody. Welcome in. It is Thursday, November 2nd, 1 p.m. Central. Two really big news items I want to go through uh, with you today. So sit back, enjoy, and let's get started right away. Let's waste no time. <laughs> All right. So here's a post from Elon Musk on X. Excited to announce that SpaceX Starlink has achieved break-even cash flow. Excellent work by a great team. Starlink is now is also now a majority of all active satellites and will have launched a majority of all satellites cumulative, cumulatively from Earth by next year. Now, this is a really, really big deal. This is a quest that SpaceX has been on for a really long time to enable the company to essentially get itself to Mars. Uh, it's been working on reusable rockets. It's been working on sending satellites satellites to space. And this threshold is one of the most important for the company to ensure its long term survival. And it's done. Uh, it's reached this point through a lot of dominance really in the industry. Tesla is a company that we cover quite quite often on this uh, channel. And SpaceX, it's kind of like a Tesla of aerospace engineering or aerospace industry, but like times 10. And to really highlight how big of a gap they have, I asked my ex-followers, what's your favorite chart out there that explains SpaceX's dominance? And so here's one from Timmy that he posted. Here you can see how much mass SpaceX has sent to space versus its competition. This is SpaceX and here is everybody else. Uh, China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, a whole country is in second place, and a private corporation in the United States in SpaceX is number one by a very long shot. Shot, And then here you also have a chart from another user on X. Uh, this is from Gonzalo, who owns the most satellites uh, that's going around Earth. SpaceX on their own, this is as of uh, one or two years ago, they have about half, <laughs> half of the satellites in space, totaling about 3,400 as of the time of the uh, of this graph, but it's actually significantly more. It's it's about 5,000 now in 2023, but it really just shows how dominant they are in the space industry. Now, in case you're not familiar, I, I think a lot of you probably are, but in case you're new, I have a lot of new folks coming to my channel, so thank you so much. SpaceX is able to do this by reusing rockets, so this is something they've been doing for a really long time. Essentially, they send a rocket in space and they bring it back, and that enables, enables two things. It enables them to send a lot more stuff to space a lot more quickly than everybody else and it also allows them to dramatically bring down the cost of of space because now you're not uh, uh using a, a rocket and then sending it into the ocean and i have to build a new one you can use the same one over and over again now when i read a post from uh, a good friend of the show dave lee he has a phenomenal youtube channel if you don't follow him on youtube make sure you go check him out if you don't follow him on x make sure you go find him at dave hey dave seven just to kind of encapsulate his thoughts here. Uh, break even cash flow for SpaceX is a big deal. For the first time going forward, SpaceX does not need to rely on raising capital to fund operations or expenses. And Starlink now has over 5,000 satellites, making up the majority of all satellites in space, which is the number we just talked about. Starlink also has over 2 million customers worldwide. This recurring subscription revenue is providing the revenue that brings SpaceX to break even cash flow. Now, to do some very rough math on what 2 million customers actually means for uh, SpaceX and Starlink. So I went to Starlink's website and I looked up their four different plans that they have for Starlink customers. They have a standard priority, mobile and mobile priority. And their cheapest one, the standard, is about 120 bucks a month. And that 2 million figure is everybody. But if we just do, do some very simple math and say, okay, just assume everyone's paying that 120 bucks a month, right? And you plug it into a spreadsheet. Starlink is generating about $240 million per month of revenue at a minimum, most likely, if you just assume 2 million customers and each of them paying 120 bucks per month. It will probably be more on average because they have a lot of commercial customers as well. That brings a yearly revenue. So if you times that by 12, it brings their yearly revenue to almost $3 billion per year. And so that's money now that Starlink has in the bank that's going to SpaceX as well, that's allowing SpaceX to reach the level that they have right now. And if you compare... SpaceX and Starlink to their competition, this is again kind of similar to the Tesla story somewhat. Um, 
this is some news that broke earlier this this month or rather like three days ago uh, boeing which is one of the biggest providers of uh space industry industry stuff rockets and whatnot they halt the plan for starlink's competitor uh and they given up the license to operate in low earth orbit probably because it's difficult it's very hard i mean they call it rocket science for a reason what's interesting is uh elon musk replied to this post and said competing with spacex is tough um and then Almost on a on a similar <laughs> wavelength, let, let's say, there was a post that Elon Musk had about three years ago, September 28th, 2020, where he said that Starlink will probably IPO, but only several years into the future when revenue growth is smooth and predictable. Public market does not like erratic cash flow. Haha. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of retail, small retail investors will make sure they get top priority. You can hold me to it. And again, this was September 28th of 2020. So it's going to be interesting to see if SpaceX has now reached that sort of predictable cash flow, predictable revenue growth for that um, part of the business to IPO. And for those that are not familiar, IPO stands for initial public offering, which is basically when a stock becomes available for the public to purchase, just like you can purchase, say, Tesla stock or Microsoft or Apple or Walmart, whatever those companies are that are public. So it's going to be very interesting to track if this uh, comes to fruition. Some people are saying most likely sometime in 2024, maybe 2025, but we'll see. We'll see if SpaceX and Starlink have reached that time. All right. And then for the second topic, this one's just <laughs> mind blowing. Let's go ahead and get started on this one. So Jim Cramer, uh, I don't think he's a friend of the show. He blocked me on X <laughs> a while ago. Probably because I said something not appropriate, but it's okay. Um, there were some comments from him uh, that were made today regarding the Tesla Cybertruck. And I want you to pay close attention to how he's reading what he's saying and what he's saying. Let's go ahead and play. Do make sure you can hear this in the comment section. And then uh, let's go ahead and see what Jimmy Kramer has to say. Phil, let me posit something to you. You know, there was a lot of people, there was a twin blow against Ford. There was the, obviously the union, people didn't like the quarter. But then there right. was also this uh, Tesla, uh, this Cybertruck, I, I, $100,000 for a Cybertruck that I have a Maverick, okay? Apparently this does not have the payload of a Maverick, which fits in a small parking spot on any urban street in this country. Um, I checked and the durability of the metal is not there. I wonder whether this man can sell even 50,000 of the 200,000 Cybertrucks. And this may be for zero after all of the Sturm and Drang about Sean Fain and how he took it to farming. I will say with this regard to the Cybertruck, and we should see the first ones delivered at the end of this month. At least that's the plan from Tesla at this point. It's going to be a slow ramp up in production. They're not even going to get up to where they would consider full production until well into 2025. Uh, and I also think you should keep, in this, keep this in mind, given the price point, given the design, given the cap capability of the vehicle and what it's designed for. It's going for the urban market, particularly those are urban markets that are into electric vehicles. Southern California, Oregon, Washington, the coasts. You're not going to see the Cybertruck in big numbers in Kansas City, St. Louis. I mean, it's just not going to sell there. Will there be some? Yes, eventually there will be some. But I do not look at this as one, Sarah, that is a vehicle that people are going to say, well, I'm not driving the Chevy Silverado or F-150 anymore. I'm driving the Cybertruck. I just, I just don't see that happening. Yeah, as a threat there. And in the meantime, it faces enormous challenges, according to Elon Musk, in getting off the production line. Yeah. Phil, thank you. Interesting stuff, huh? <laughs> All right, let's tackle a few of the comments that, that were made on, on this. First, but, but first, I really want to highlight this post. This is from Jeff Lutz. Very smart guy. Do make sure you follow him on X. Uh, form four written talking points when he's looking down to read. Interesting, right? He's just looking down, reading stuff. I don't know. Let's. He's probably right, but let's let's go ahead and, and attack some of the things that here uh, Jim was saying here. And by attack, I mean let's see if they're right. Um, all right. So toughness of the of the metal of the Cybertruck. We had this thing happen on the Joe Rogan podcast where Joe Rogan tried shooting uh, a 80 pound arrow into the Cybertruck. It bounced off. It left a little bit of a dent. Judge for yourself. Uh, this video from a, a while ago or a few days ago that is loud uh, of a Cybertruck being shot up by a tummy gun 50 cal of uh, 45 cal bullets. I don't know. Does that seem? <laughs> 
I don't want to make any assumptions. Maybe Jim's right, okay? Let's talk about the price. $100,000 was the number that was thrown out there. This is probably originating from a rumor that was on Facebook where there was uh, an, an anonymous person that said that they had a reservation that came through where the company was quoting them 100,000, 989 plus 7,000 plus TTL. So I'm assuming that's where that rumor's coming from. And it's fascinating to see CNBC comment on rumors the way they are. Maybe they're not. Maybe they have some, uh, some intelligence that we don't. They are, after all, a huge corporation. They have so many resources and they're just so accurate with their reporting, right? Then let's look at one of Cyberstruck's uh, main competitors, uh, which is going to be the F-150 Lightning. And this is where I think the $100,000 figure is probably incorrect. You have the F-150 Lightning lineup here. The Pro starts at 49.9, XLT at 54.9. But then if, even if you add the extended range battery to those pickup trucks, you go up to 69.9. Uh, the Lariat, the Lariat, whatever you want to call it, it's up to 77.5 with the extended range battery. And you got a Platinum at top of top of the line. Uh, F-150 that at, starts at 92. Now, I, the reason why I think $100,000 is probably incorrect for this truck is because if we look at some of the existing data for Tesla's vehicles, let me go ahead and fix this so we can see this. This is a chart that I showed uh, a bunch of times on this channel. Here's every single Tesla SUV or every single EV SUV that's out there in the market in the United States. The, the dots in red are Teslas. Here's how expensive they are. 100,000 down to 20,000 down here, which don't exist any. Any of them don't exist. So here's 40,000. You can see that Tesla is con consistently some of the cheapest vehicles you can buy for each uh, one of the segments that they're in at, at the different price points with some of the best mileage you can also get for those cars. And so it stands to reason, I, I would I would think, that the Cybertruck is going to follow a similar trend once it's launched. I'm not saying that it won't be 100000 at some trims, but it could be. It could be much more affordable than people think. When I say that, I mean closer to maybe $70,000, especially if you include the EV tax credit. But let's just forget and say, okay, even if the price is $100,000, um, will it be able to sell what it needs to sell over the long term? And I think one of the clear trends that Tesla is on that seems like they're on is that they're dramatically reducing price. So even if they start at 100000 I'm quite confident they'll have a electric pickup truck that's going to be sold somewhere around the $60,000 to $70,000 long term, maybe even uh, cheaper than that, and maybe even sooner than that. So the $100,000 figure, I just, I don't think is going to happen, but who knows, I could be wrong. Let's next talk about the payload. So one of the things that um, Jim Kramer said is that, hey, it looks like, when he's reading, it looks like the uh, Tesla Cybertruck is going to have less payload than my Maverick and the Maverick has 1500 pound uh, payload or so. So somebody's telling him or he thinks that it's going to be less than 1500. And what I'm guessing is happening here this is just my guess is that they're taking the gross vehicle weight ratings that were released for the Cybertruck not too long ago. And then there's two different classes that the Cybertruck's going to fit in, which is going to be their class G, which is going to be between eight to 9,000 gross vehicle weight, which includes all the weight plus the payload on the truck, not including the trailer. So that's one of the categories. And the other one is 9,000 to 10,000 pounds. My guess is what happened here, either Jim or whatever he was reading, is that on the Joe Rogan podcast, the Elon said that it was going to be uh, around 7,000 pounds, likely at max configuration, meaning the the biggest battery, the most uh, the, the most motors you can have on the truck, around 7,000. And my guess is somebody took this lower number, this 8,000 number, and they're like, hey, it's probably a thousand payload. So yeah, it probably is probably not going to have that much payload. But I find that really, really hard to believe, mainly because if you look at, again, Tesla's main competitor, which is going to be the F-150 Lightning, if you look at the two maximum payload figures from the F-150 Lightning, it's 2235 and 1952 for the extended range. So these are around 2000 pounds at a minimum. And back when Tesla had their uh, unveil back in November of 2019, the number they stated uh, for all of us was 3,500. It's probably going to be closer to say 3,000 because I think what's happening here, if my educated guess is that this class G of 8,000 to 9,000 pounds probably applies to the lower, uh, the smaller battery, which is going to be a lighter vehicle. So the difference between the gross vehicle weight rating and the weight of the 
truck is going to be somewhere around two to three thousand pounds and then as you add more batteries i think the gvwr is going to go up to account for that uh, ability to carry payload on the truck so but i could be wrong listen it could have less payload than a f-150 lightning even though the bed is half a foot longer i could be wrong listen what crazier things have happened okay i i, I don't know a lot of things then as far as the uh uh, trend uh, as as far as the commentary that was made around hey i think this is going to be a coastal product i don't think a lot of people in the interior of the united states are going to want this truck uh so on and so forth so i did just a quick google trend search on the tesla model y for the past day and i looked at how the uh the car was trending as far as searches go on google this is for the model y you can see very clearly and the darker spots in the in the country are the ones where most of the interest is coming from for that car so tesla model y is very obviously dominated here by the west coast california nevada washington new jersey you also got some vermont new york so on florida texas Georgia that's in and, and you got some Colorado in there probably because they have a lot of uh, very lucrative EV tax credits in that state but if we do the same thing for Cybertruck and I and I'm curious to see if you'll see the same thing the spread seems a lot more even right so let's check the color the colors here so look at the Model Y and look at the Cybertruck Model Y Cybertruck to me it looks like this middle of the country here that's sort of pretty light which indicates not a lot of interest right and the cyber trucks quite a bit darker to the point where south dakota is actually the most interested on the cyber truck based on the last 24 hours of searches next by vermont, uh, vermont and then nevada so to me it looks like there might be a little bit of a uh i think i think it's not correct to say that the cyber truck is going to be strictly a coastal product i think there's going to be interest for the truck uh, across the entire country but it's going to be tough to see until we get there right until we launch until the truck launches rather and then uh the pricing is released for that for that vehicle so we'll see we'll see what happens there we'll see what happens there um let me end with this <laughs> i found this pretty funny there's this thing called the uh jim kramer in uh <laughs> what is it called uh elon called it here the the inverse kramer the inverse kramer which basically means that anything jim says turns out to be reality but the opposite all right so let's go ahead and listen to this this is back from i believe 2010 2011 when tesla first ipo'd when tesla first came out with their stock let's go ahead and take a listen what um and cnbc and elon musk were saying you know what i'm not sure that this is a smart investment our own jim kramer yesterday said i'm not sure that tesla has a business plan that's going to work it's not a smart investment what do you say to the skeptics who look at where tesla is the money that you're raising and they say you know what they've got a nice roadster but they don't have a good business plan well i think you know uh, you know jim i'd say yeah sure jim you know we're no best stones uh but i think we're going to do okay <laughs> you know jim i think recommended best owns and layman and other things so you know frankly he's contraindicator you know what I and of course uh Bear Stearns and those banks are the banks that went under during the uh, financial crisis of 2008 so uh and maybe that explains why the stock is up uh, almost six <laughs> percent who knows we'll see anyway let me leave it there. Thank you so much for joining. We'll do an extended uh, Q&A session tomorrow on Fridays. I'll try to do that moving forward as well. But thank you for stopping in, and I hope you have a great day. Love you very much, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.